probably well know, Darwin and Wallace were clearly fascinated by understanding how the distributions of species that we see or they saw in that time, how they came about and encoding different mechanisms to explain those distributions. Furthermore, although there are a number of individual level characteristics, like for this wood frog, habitat requirements, behaviors, morphology, that are uh, clearly interesting, there's only one species characteristic or something that the whole species has, and that's its distribution. So a single individual doesn't have the distribution of the whole species, but the distribution is likely a composite of all these different individual level factors. So distributions, like this wood frog distribution here, can come in different flavors, like the area, vastly different areas they can cover, or the shape that they might have. So in this case, more continuous type distribution versus something that's more isolated or fragmented, like a disjunct distribution. And these disjunct distributions, I think, are really interesting to consider because to explain them, we need to look at both the origin, <coughs> about what sort of historical, geologic, or uh, climatic factors may have influenced their distribution, like uh, uh, glaciers. And also, and this to me is very interesting, how are these individual level characteristics maintained in the absence or likely absence of contemporary gene flow? So there may be some sort of ecological and or demographic constraints that are limiting them from expanding to these disjunct or isolated fragments. So there are a lot of species that may show disjunct distributions, and today I'm going to be focusing on one in the eastern United States that has this really unique distribution. And this is this adorable little pinebearing tree frog. I mean, how can you not love that mix? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> So it's Hyla Anderson and I, these are pretty small frogs, about three and a half centimeters. And they're found in Florida and Alabama, so this eastern United States here, Florida and Alabama, which I'll represent with red throughout the talk and either the state abbreviations or this two-letter abbreviation. North and South Carolina, that will always be in black or gray. And then New Jersey, which will be in blue. And so it's found in these three roughly equivalent sized uh, isolated fragments. And I'll note that the eastern part of North Carolina, most of these populations have been extirpated, so they really are fairly equivalent to areas that they cover in each of these regions. But not only does this species have a disjunct distribution and a unique one for eastern North America, uh, but it's also a habitat specialist. So it, it breeds in seepage bogs throughout this area within longleaf pine or pine barren habitat. And this is really interesting for disjunct distributions because, as I mentioned, looking at ecological restrictions or limitations on the expansion of the species from these isolated areas is a good hypothesis to test. And finally, it's a, a conservation concern. So in each of the states where it occurs, it's either threatened or endangered, although it doesn't have a federal listing currently. OK, so lots of research questions uh, for my dissertation, because this frog hasn't really been looked at for over 30 decades, or th sorry, 30 decades, 30 years. Um, and so the first question is just, is this really one species, or are there three species here? So looking at the magnitude of difference among the regions. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. A uh, paper recently came out in Molecular Ecology, if you want to look more into this. But considering three different data sets in a multivariate framework, we see that on the first axis of variation for each of these orthometric, acoustic, and microsatellite genetic data, uh, we can see a latitudinal and longitudinal gradient of variation. So what you'll note is that these red and blue, so the two furthest regions, have very little overlap in trace space. Um, and there's actually even further separation in the genetic data set. So like I said, I'm not going to mention this too much, but just that we do conclude that this is one species. There's a lot of overlap in the morphometric and acoustic traits. And what I'll talk about more today is understanding <coughs> its, its evolutionary history. So that'll be the focus of the rest of my talk today. But I'll mention again that this ecological limit on dis distribution is really interesting to consider and something I'm looking into, as well as the demographic constraints within uh, the different regions. OK, so to address the second question, I'm using reduced representation libraries, which is something I imagine many of you are familiar with at this point. So just to summarize what that is, you're generating genome-wide polymorphism data from sites across many individuals using next-generation sequencing. So there are lots of methods that are now available, but we're starting to compare those, and there's kind of few comparisons right now. And so I'm proposing to use both a target enrichment approach, in this case, the anchored phylogenomics, and a RAD-seq sort of restriction enzyme digestion approach, and specifically the free RAD protocol. That's a variant of dual or double digest uh, RAD, and this is an unpublished protocol by Travis Blake. <coughs> so question 
questions here, things like how many loci, how useful are these loci in terms of polymorphisms in order to understand this, uh, these differences within a phylogeographic context. Before I get too much further into the methods, I do want to point out what might we expect to see in these phylogenies for, for this specific species. So again, using these three colors and these abbreviations for the three regions, the null hypothesis would just be that this is some sort of polytomy. There's really no resolution among the three regions. Probably unexpected because of what I showed before with the microsatellite data. So there may have been, instead, we would suspect that there's an influence from the glacier period in the United States and North America in general. So although you can see that New Jersey itself was never glaciated, it's likely that these were displaced through climate change further south, and that as the glaciers receded, they may have expanded north. So perhaps we might expect to see that Florida and Alabama are sister to these more recently expanded uh, regions, New Jersey and the Carolinas, or that they've now the Jersey has now formed its own uh, clade, and we see this ladder-like pattern in the Carolinas. Or we could see that all three regions have completely resolved in the phylogeny. Okay, so walking through just briefly some methods, I went in the field and collected tissue samples, specifically toe clips, because as I mentioned, these are conservation conserved species. So these are useful for going back out and finding the same individuals uh, over a couple of years. They don't like to move very much, so you can find them within a meter uh, of the year before. And for the two different methods, first the anchored methods, uh, this is just taking genomic DNA, quality control, sonication to break it apart, library preparation, enriching it for the set of probes that you're interested in, and I'll talk about that in just a second, sequencing, and then using a custom assembly pipeline for read assembly, and uh, sequence alignment, which was developed by Alan Lemon, and then using RaxML for phylogeny estimation. So I call this kind of the modified Lemon et al. 2012 approach, because this is including the amphibian probe kit, so specific uh, capture loci for amphibians. And these are fairly long, you know, 1,350 base pairs. And this also included some very recently developed uh, Sudacris, so it's a related genus with both long and short anonymous nuclear loci. So this is about 1,600 different target loci that were uh, pulled out of the genome. In contrast, 3RAD is much smaller, the focus is on much smaller uh, markers, but you're using an enzyme digestion, and in this case, three enzymes shown here to cut up the DNA, and then we use a size selection on Pippin prep to pull out about, on average, 200 <coughs> base pair uh, loci. And in this case, I'm using pair and pyrat for the assembly. Okay, so the overall sampling for this project uh, is just shown here. And just to note, the purple is just saying both of the data, or both types of library preparation methods were used for those sites, and the orange is just RADSeq. So in total, I had, in total for the anchor, I had 26 individuals in my in group, about equal across the three regions, one per locality and two outgroup individuals, and then for three rad, much higher number of sampling because we expect to get some missing data and some dropout of the individuals, so one to three per locality with five outgroup. So for the three rad data, using PyRad, um, I ended up removing any samples that had a too few number of, of reads, so this is less than 185,000, and for the settings in PyRad, I chose to use 18 individuals to retain a locus, so this is about 25% of the in-group being sampled. So the total final data set was reduced to 76 <coughs> individuals, five out-group total, with 1,700 loci, but this was 75% missing data, and the average locus length was about what we would expect, 212. Total SNPs for the in-group, again, this is a huge amount of missing data. So for today, I'm not gonna be talking about phylogeny results for RADSeq, and I also did want to mention that there's some weird size clustering that I'm getting. So to explain this a little bit better, this is number of reads on the x-axis and number of loci per sample on the y-axis in the final data set. And what you'll note is that there's sort of three clumps. So individuals had either around 20 loci represented, around 500, or around 1,200. And I'm not really sure what's going on with this other than to think that something's kind of weird with the analysis because it doesn't seem to match any sort of regional type clustering or anything like that. So strange things going on, possibly trying stacks in some of the talks that I've been to uh, for this conference and helped think more about how I might analyze this data. So I'm only going to be presenting on the anchor data today. 
So what did I have for this one? All 26 samples were presented, and this included 459 loci with, yay, two and, two and a half missing data, um, 630 base pairs, and just to give you a sense for this range of locus, remember that I had short and long anonymous, as well as the more typical conserved uh, amphibian probe kit, so ranging all the way up to 2,500 base pairs. And these were phased alleles, so each individual will be shown with two sequences. And this is just a concatenated Braxmel tree to give you a sense for what this phylogeny will look like. Okay, so again, using these same three colors for the three regions, uh, the, the, the picture dot values that are in bold are above 85, and the individual sequences that are in bold are all the sequence ones, just to remind you that there are two per individual. Um, so we can see those two sequences, and three clades are formed. So you can see Florida and Alabama is sister to everyone else. Mm -hmm. South Carolina formed its own clade, and New Jersey formed a clade. However, North Carolina was paraphyletic, so it's within this sort of New Jersey, North Carolina group. And you might note this kind of sort of weird sequence pattern in New Jersey. So there's only one individual shown here that actually had its sequence one and sequence two sister to each other, whereas all the sequence twos were very strongly grouped and all the sequence ones otherwise were very strongly grouped. So this is kind of <coughs> strange to think about and is unlikely to be due to the analysis because otherwise we would have seen that throughout the tree. Also, uh, this Florida locality up here is very strongly uh, separated from the other Florida and Alabama individuals. And so this was interesting to me because in the microsatellite data using a structure analysis at K equals three, this population using 19 individuals uh, really sticks out from everyone else in Florida and Alabama. So this was interesting to note that it came up again in the uh, much larger data set. Okay, so returning to those hypotheses I presented at the beginning, what we see here is essentially this ladder-like uh, kind of tree where Florida and Alabama and New Jersey are clades, but also South Carolina forms a separate clade. And what does this all mean? Well, it's very suggestive of northward expansion post-glaciation, although I'd like to test this in a, in a better framework and more quantitatively. But this interesting Florida uh, population that I mentioned could be due perhaps to some interspecific hybridization that's going on with related species scenario that has a very similar call structure. So they tend to make mistakes um, so this may be why that particular population where we found hybrids could, could be popping out differently. And also, you noted that the North and South Carolina seem pretty different in terms of South Carolina showing a different clade. And there is a river that runs almost right between those two groups. So that could explain this separation. And finally, this weird sequence grouping in New Jersey. Perhaps there's two different lineages that invaded, and so all of the individuals seem to have one of each. Um, this is kind of not clear what's going on there, but I'd be happy to take any suggestions if you talk to me after. Uh, otherwise, as I mentioned, you know, I want to do this and uh, test these models in a better framework, so something like parametric bootstrapping or Bayesian model comparisons, which we'll hear more about in the next talk. And then timing and divergence would be really critical for these three regions. And also comparing these results with paleoclimate data and, and modeling them. Finally, I mentioned that I am interested in looking at how rat seed can anchor the form, and so that's something that I'll be looking into as well, the utility of these different approaches <laughs> that that are generated in resolving uh, phylogeographic relationships. So with that, lots of people to thank and funding sources, uh, particularly Bryce Newman's lab and Hal Lemon for the bioinformatics and lab work help, and uh, otherwise, thanks to all of you, and I'd be happy to see you.